The original contact between Ms. Daniels and Trump goes all the way back to 2006 in this picture that you see there of them at the time. Of course, that's long before Obama was reelected and elected or reelected. It's long before Donald Trump responded to Obama with birtherism and then a political crusade and then eventually himself ran for office. Five years later, Daniels was considering going public to a kind of magazine called a tabloid or a kind of a pop culture magazine. And then she faced threats at the time as she later recounted. No article then ran. Someone had told the story about me and Trump to In Touch magazine in 2011. The publisher said that I had to take a polygraph test. I passed 100% with flying colors in May of 2011. I was with my daughter and I was threatened by someone I didn't know in a parking lot about the Trump story. And then the story was never mentioned again. I definitely slept better after that, knowing that it was killed and never coming out. That's Miss Daniels' account that based on just the human reality of going through it, she felt better. She says, quote, slept better at that time when the whole thing kind of went away. Here's how it was killed, though. A Trump rep told the magazine's general counsel that Trump would aggressively pursue legal action, quote, if the story was printed, as The Guardian reported. And that magazine folded. And I mentioned the political history, because at the time, if it was one more story about some sort of fading half joke of a reality star, then that magazine may not have seen a reason to go get into a whole legal battle about it. So they did fold, but that's not all. That representative for Trump at the time was a lawyer named Michael Cohen, who was then a very aggressive Trump defender. Some called him a fixer. And he put the heat on that magazine and anyone else who was doing things Trump didn't want. But Cohen was in pretty much the same role during the 2016 campaign, which, of course, now is many years later, when then-candidate Trump wanted to keep that long-buried story still buried. But the stakes were way higher after that Access Hollywood tape came out. Tapes were on Cohen's mind while he did Trump's dirty work. All of that would later lead to his own conviction and incarceration, of course. But Cohen was making tapes of his discussion with the candidate, now defendant, you see in the photo, and the other gentleman there, which, again, as I told you, you may be kind of vaguely remembering him, but he was very important. Donald Trump knew how to get things done and undone in New York. And he wanted this man to do his dirty work. And Cohen had the tape running as they discussed David Pecker, who they called, quote, our friend David. I need to open up a company for the transfer of all of that info regarding our friend David. I spoke to Alan about it when it comes time for the financing, which will be... What financing? We'll have to pay you. So Don't pay with cash. No, 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 no. no. Yeah, it's just pay with cash. You know, you're already doing secret stuff. Why would you want any records? Well, the DA can argue Trump wanted cash precisely because he wanted to cover his tracks. And while Cohen did not ultimately evade accountability, as a lawyer, he may have said no, 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 because any lawyer will tell you, if you're going to pay a lot of money in cash, you're actually opening up new problems because the people who receive it and people who hear about it will be able to then tell the IRS and other government entities, yeah, they just hit it all. Tax evasion, among other issues, can come up. Now, in this trial, the DA can call Pecker and his employee doing a lot of this work, Dylan Howard, over how they contacted Cohen shortly before the 2016 election and how Cohen reached out with 130K. That is now evidence in this looming trial of defendant Trump. The DA <clears throat> is making a couple bets here. One, that he has the goods. They say, if you shoot at the king, you better not miss. Remember, DA Bragg was the first prosecutor to ever show up and actually indict Donald Trump for anything. Others came after him. Going first is the toughest. So he doesn't want to lose. He is betting that this rather salacious and interesting subject matter and the trail of headlines will help him keep the jury's attention. Here was one of them all the way back in the day, courtesy of that same magazine I mentioned to you in touch. Quote, my affair with Donald was one of the stories that came out courtesy of Daniels. There were secret efforts we later learned to kill headlines like that. 
The DA is going to show the headlines. He's going to show that secret tape I just played you and all this messy drama. So jurors pay attention and are riveted. But the DA is going to argue that it's riveting, it's interesting. You always want to keep people's attention when you tell a story in court or anywhere else. But that it is important, not because it's salacious, but because it was a long-running criminal plot. Now, defendant Trump is presumed innocent. The burden is on the DA to not only prove this occurred, some of it clearly did, but to not only prove it happened, but that it was an intentional crime, and apparently an election crime. And the DA has to prove two crimes here to make the felony stick. Otherwise, this would be a New York business fraud case, which is not good. You don't want to commit business fraud. Any normal person would be stressed about that, could get in trouble about that. But to create the felony trial that we're about to go into next week, the DA had to make this campaign link. So the DA wants to show the larger pattern that the tabloids tried to kill another potentially damaging story also around campaign season. This one got less attention, but you may recall some of it, a former model who had her own Trump story, which the same sort of tabloid team on Trump's behalf, they argue, managed to buy and bury. Why do you think they squashed the story? Back then or now? Now. Um, they, they, they didn't want to hurt him. You think it's because of a personal relationship with the guy who runs AMI, is friends with Donald Trump? Correct. That friend in AMI, that's the reference to the witness I told you about, David Pecker. Now, this matters legally because anything that gets into the campaign season gets into a much more serious set of laws. There's a limit on what you can give a candidate under law. And you can't go over that limit. And if you know about that limit and take other measures to try to route around it, that's even worse than just breaking the law, because now you're clearly showing evidence and intent to go break it on purpose. In other words, if there's a $2,000 limit and you thought you could give three, that might not be the biggest deal in the world. But if there's a $2,000 limit and you start finding other people to sneak two, four, six, eight more, other people or companies to sneak money to the candidate, you have a problem. And by the way, just to be clear, to remind everyone as we say, what are we even talking about? If you could get away with all this, if it was that easy under the law to route that money around through other entities, companies, and people, well, corruption would be way worse in the United States than it already is. So you can't just say, oh, I, I need my buddies at another company to spend $100,000 to benefit the campaign and do that 10, 20, or 100 times. And when you're powerful, running for president or a former president, can you imagine how many people might be willing to go along with that? So here's the allegation. This corporation was, according to the DA, spending many, many thousands on Trump's behalf as a campaign benefit, a kind of secret, illegal, criminal, in-kind donation. That's what we're going to get from these witnesses at the trial. And then we're going to get Trump's defense. And we will be covering, as I've mentioned, both sides of it. The burdens on the prosecution. But Trump's defense, whatever it may be, including that he was out of the loop or these were just overzealous tabloid fans or you can't believe what you read in the tabloids. We're going to cover all those defenses. But the D.A. is going to go forward with this and they have these witnesses. Now, I mentioned that other witness who's not as famous, Keith Davidson. He was a lawyer for that model. He also represented Stormy Daniels at one time before lawyer Michael Avenatti. And in our efforts to get the information from all the sources, I've told you, we go to all the primary sources, we can. And if you're watching this and you're a primary source, get in touch. We would love to have you on the beat. Well, Mr. Davidson, now witness, once told us right here on the beat about this when we were tracking down the evidence about a clearly growing scandal. The affairs happened in 2006. Uh, Michael Cohen and I uh, first contacted each other about the matter in 2011. So at a minimum, they knew uh, about me and about uh, Stormy at a minimum uh, in 2011. They knew about it in 2012 and 13 and 14. They knew about it in 2015. They knew about it when Donald Trump declared uh, that he was a right. candidate for president of the United States. They knew about it this whole United way, States. and the money only comes through at the end. They knew about it, the point there being if you want to say this wasn't about the campaign, which is what makes it more likely criminal, if you want to say, oh, we just did this in general back in the day, well, that witness, and we got that early jump on what he would say here in this interview, but that witness who's not doing press right now but might show up in the witness box against Trump, he's saying follow the money because the money came through as a campaign matter. 
If that's true and they prove that and the jury agrees, well, then they have Trump dead to rights. Now, after Donald Trump made it to the White House, Cohen, who was musing about why you have to do this the right way, and Trump, who was saying, maybe we just pay in cash, well, Trump did pay him back through eight different checks to Cohen. And they wanted to keep that all secret, and they did until it blew up in January 2018. Now, that was a long time ago, and the underlying incident was even a longer time ago. Very few people could have seen how those events would lead to this first ever criminal trial of a former president. But most people didn't know about any of this. Defendant Trump had some inkling it might get out of control. He had his plots. He had his deals. He had his schemes. He had his instinct for how to avoid that. Let's just do it in cash. And let's be clear about how things work. And by the way, the DA may make this point to the jury. Those types of plots and tactics and hiding have worked for Donald Trump in other contexts, in other cases. He certainly delayed and ducked other probes or obfuscated and confused things so much. But that's failed here. So six years out from that Wall Street Journal report first breaking this story and some of these individuals changing in their relationship to Donald Trump, he goes on trial for the plots with possible witnesses that include three of the men who worked so hard and furtively to hide his secrets, the tabloid Chief Pecker, who ducked his own possible indictment by cooperating in earlier cases, his employee, Mr. Howard, and for Donald Trump, clearly the scariest witness, Michael Cohen, who has served prison time for Donald Trump, who now has the key testimony that could get Trump convicted and who his lawyer told us last night will be corroborated by many other people. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone, you hit search on the bottom right corner, you type in MSNBC, you click on the MSNBC app, you click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.